Hi, Ricky here. Um, we're just about to start today's class on media prep, plate pouring, and all you taking. So, um, for all these beautiful people assembled here, this is approximately today's agenda. We're going to start by preparing some media. We need to get things mixed up into the autoclave. The autoclave will take at least an hour and a half to run, so it needs to get going. Those of you who need to leave early, you need to leave early. And so, so does. Like, there is no obligation to stay for the whole thing. Um, but that, that needs to happen ASAP. Number two, I poured a whole bunch of plate yesterday. So we're going to start this whole temperature genetic project by actually plating onto those plates. Um, so that's going to that's gonna involve working with our safety cabinet and learning how to handle the transfer of liquid culture onto solid media, how to handle the plates um, and work with the incubators. Um, I also went ahead and streaked a couple of plates just with some E. coli. You guys can get some hands-on hands -on practice with picking colonies, picking individual colonies off of previously streaked plates and re-streaking that to a new plate. Um, last but not least, I expect that by the time we're done with two and three, the autoclave will be completely done, and we can then turn around and pour plates with the media we want. And that's, uh, that's basically the agenda for today. So, um, yeah, I want us to make a whole bunch of plates with flat tea in the media, and I would like us to try um, three different recipes. I'm going to try with... Uh, I'm going to try with regular agar. We have um, we have some old bags of agar sitting in the cabinet that kind of need to get used, uh, <laughs> so I can get myself an excuse to buy some more. Um, so I want to use that. I want to try it with santhane gum, um, which is a safe shelling agent. It has some slightly different properties. It doesn't form as hard a gel. It can be a little bit trickier to work with, but it has the advantage. So, so that's probably a good thing. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're just, we're gonna make the same big batch of tea, add as much sugar as we think is appropriate, and then we'll split that out into two batches. One of those batches will add back to agar, to another, we'll add the same thing gum, and to the last one, we'll mix those two. Um, and then we'll autoclave those three bottles and we'll pour plates from all of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm not going to walk you guys around the lab, but I am going to give you the basic safety guidelines, which is number one, what? absolutely no food or drink on that side. I know we're making tea in the lab, which I'm weird. Um, but since we're not drinking tea, uh, that's okay. Bacteria will be there. But no food or drink in the lab ever. Um, don't bring it in there because you have no idea what this contaminated with and what you're going to end up um, Number two, when you're in the lab, always wear gloves. Again, no idea what other people are doing around here. Um, and that is primarily to protect yourself. It is also to protect your experiments from you because you're a seething, filthy, roiling mass of bacteria. Um, and since we're trying to culture <laughs> bacteria, uh, try to keep your microbiota separate from what you're working with is pretty important. Um, number three is don't use equipment you don't know how to use and haven't been trained on. Some of these things are actually dangerous and auto will blow up your face. A centric tube is handled, will take your head off. This is not uh, this is not a safe hobby. <laughs> it's not. So counterculture labs, we are uh, a community lab. We're a hackerspace for biotechnology. Um, so we work on a regular hackerspace model. You can become a member and then use all of our equipment, essentially. Uh, we also do a lot of classes uh, and various meetups. Those are all open to the public and you don't need to be a member. Um, we like to ask for a small fee for the classes, but uh, all our classes are open to anybody. If, if you can't afford to pay, you don't have to. Uh, we like to keep things accessible as much as possible. Um, so we have uh, a number of projects running currently. Uh, there's one uh, an open insulin project. We're trying to uh, 
develop uh, new methods for producing insulin. So we can break the monopoly that these three large pharmaceutical companies have on insulin production. Uh, we have a real vegan cheese project, trying to make real cheese proteins in yeast. So we can make actual cheese, not some fake cheese, uh, but without any animal suffering and with a lot less greenhouse gas emissions. We have a plant biology group that meets every other week. Uh, if anybody is interested in working on lab robotics, we have a giant liquid handling robot in the basement that we're trying to get up back and up and running. Um, we are very much uh, a duocracy. Uh, everything that happens here happens because somebody thought it was a great idea and managed to get a couple of other people on board. Uh, so we are a uh, completely volunteer run nonprofit 501c3 uh, with voting members. So we, we have a board and all of that good stuff, but uh, our members have the right to kick anybody off of the board if they want to and install a new president and all of that. <laughs> That's us. Uh, the building you're in here is called the Omni Commons. Uh, so there's about a dozen different collectives in here. It's collective collectives, all sort of with a somewhat social justice mission. Uh, right next to us here is Pseudo Room. That's a more traditional hackerspace in terms of what topics they work on. So it's more electronics and computers and mesh networking and robotics and things like that. Uh, yeah, welcome to Counterculture Labs. <laughs> so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna measure out that we're just gonna make a liter. We're probably not gonna use all of it because we don't technically wanna pour that many plates. That would be an absurdly large amount. Well, I mean, we should make a large batch of kombucha, obviously. Well, so if we, we use, don't need much to actually plate so out. So we do like 300 mils of tea for plating, and then we can use the rest to start some more kombucha. Mm -hmm. That's probably a good idea. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so we'll make a liter of black sweet tea. Uh, we will take 300 mils of that in three individual containers. We will add our gelling agent to those. So we're gonna start by, I'll show you guys how to use the hydrated cylinder. We'll measure out a liter of distilled water. We will weigh out um, boil the water, mix the whole thing up, prep the tea. All right, um, over here, there are gloves. There are gloves of many sizes, there are gloves of many kinds. Um, uh, find a pair that fits you. Put your bags over in here somewhere. You've got those out of the way. There isn't that much space to move around in the lab. This is a graduated cylinder. It's a fairly precise measuring instrument. They usually have indications of how accurate they are. They are calibrated at a specific temperature, um, what we call standard pressure to temperature pressure, STP. If you need super, super precise volume measurements, volumetric flasks are your friend. Uh, in a second. But don't rely on the gradations on the side of a, a regular no, beaker or, no, or Erlmeyer no. flask. Those Here's are not intended for measuring. For measuring, not something that you do something else. It just has the prompt to have measurements on it. Also, it's a little bit different when you do this in plastic than when you do it in glass, um, because generally you won't see much of the meniscus on the water when you're measuring in a plastic cylinder. But in a glass cylinder, the meniscus of the water is very apparent. So the meniscus is where the water sort of creeps off the edge. It has and you like, don't want to count that essentially for your like volume. It looks like a surface layer. It is, of course, it's just water. Um, we'll show you, we'll show you in a glass cylinder in a second, but instead of having like a perfectly sharp uh, surface or a sharp edge, so to speak, it kind of has like a, a curvy wobbly edge. And you read the bottom of that meniscus. So if it curves like this, your graduation is here, right? This is where you read. Start that heating up. And once that's boiling, we can then go ahead and add tea. Yeah. So it's not that you kind of get way boats that are plenty big to measure out 60 grams of sugar. 
bigger. It's just that we don't have any. But like these way boats, you can get them like yay big if you're measuring out really large quantities. And now, woohoo! Scientifically I'm measuring. An idiot. What? You know what? I'm going to measure how much tea is in one leaf. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to use the leaves instead because then I don't have to filter it afterwards. <laughs> And it's going to be an approximation. I know. You can, I, know. I mean, I how much? I can also filter it. Do I care about showing people how to how about, how about you open several bags and add them together so we get a better measurement? And then we just toss that out and use one of the, the other bags. Uh, yeah, I'm getting 234 in this one. Another thing to always account for when you're doing measurements is that all measurements have error. Nothing is ever exact the way you want it to be exact. So, so you always need to account for that as well, because over time, if you're doing multiple measurements on the same thing, the problem Makes is it, that I need saves a, you time. If I wanted to do six grams precisely, ah. I would be not quite three bags. So, if I'm going to actually do what I say, we, we could just take, change our recipe to three bags. Yeah, <laughs> So then we can also go ahead and just drop these in the water as that starts to boil. Mm -hmm. How much were you getting out of three bags? Did you uh, measure all three? I did not, but okay. I got 2.3, uh, approximate 2.35 out of each. Okay. So I'm going to get right around seven. So seven grams. Seven precisely, actually, yeah. instead of six. Mm -hmm. Which is probably not a big deal. So three tea bags of Lipton or seven grams of loose tea. It's seven percent versus six percent weight in my body. That's the closest. I have a question about brown sugar. Yeah. Why are you using brown sugar instead of uh, like refined white sugar? Well, or I guess that would be or just um, like raw sugar. You can totally cane sugar, raw sugar works super mm -hmm. well. Um, you, I'm using brown sugar because I've used it before and I know it works. And it's what I had uh, yeah. ready to grab when I left home this morning when I was already running kind of late. I was also here pretty late last night. I was here till after 9 p.m. So, uh, I, I have seen some recommendations not to use brown sugar because most commercial brown sugar is just made by partially caramelizing the sugar. Yeah. And the caramelization can inhibit some bacteria. This one may be partially refined sugar rather than caramelized sugar. In that case, it would even be better because you might have more micronutrients. And, yeah. And you'll probably get different mixtures of, of bacteria that respond to that. It's one of those where this is stuff we really need to test as part of this project, as far as I'm concerned. Like, this is the sort of thing that we can, that we can set up controlled experiments for. So yeah, kombucha starts with a very sweet tea. You can tell three tea bags and this much sugar, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, in this context, the tea is the nitrogen source um, and the phosphorus source and the sugar is the carbon source. Um, so carbon source is important and primary nitrogen sources are also important, but in that regard, somewhat secondary. And one of the things we will try at this point is using something other than tea for the nitrogen source. Uh, we're not doing that today, but we will. We so, can also use different carbon sources instead of sugar. Okay. We could try lactose. Uh, uh, kombucha typically has some lactic acid bacteria that turn lactose and lactic acid, uh, but they're typically a very minor set of species. But if you grow them on lactose rather than sugar, you're probably going to encourage those growing instead. Um, so carbon source is important and primary nitrogen sources are also important, but in that regard, somewhat secondary. And one of the things we will try at this point is using something other than tea for the nitrogen source. Uh, we're not doing that today, but we will. We so, can also use different carbon sources instead of sugar. Okay. We could try lactose. Uh, uh, Kombucha typically has some lactic acid bacteria that turn lactose and lactic acid, uh, but they're typically a very minor set of species. But if you grow them on lactose rather than sugar, 
you're probably going to encourage those growing instead. So we're going to be pouring petri plates with essentially a gel with nutrients inside that gel for uh, solid colonies of uh, bacteria to grow on. Uh, so typically agar. Hmm? So the nutrients in this case will be the black tea essentially we're brewing because that's what the, the kombucha normally grows on. Agar is neutral. It's like it's like a, a blank sheet of paper. If you want anything to grow in the agar, you're gonna have to mix in some some uh, uh, growth medium. So in this case, we're gonna be using the uh, the the black tea, the sweetened tea itself, to provide all the the, the growth uh, ingredients. Most times when you're trying to make media, you're gonna start with something like this and some water, and you're gonna be done because uh, the variety of media that are commercially available as pre-made powders is ridiculous. You can basically buy anything. Um, some things are incredibly specialized and will only work for a single or very, very, very few species, very limited. Other kinds are extremely broad and will work for almost anything that can grow on a solid medium. Um, we're doing a variety today, so, and we're actually going to, some of the plates we're working with are made from these two source bottles, uh, a couple of others are also had in the cabinet. Um, LB is something you're going to come across a lot. It's super, super common for growing uh, E. coli, which is a very common model organism that we use for a lot of things. It is, an, uh, it is an intestinal bacteria in nature, and LB agar, or LB in general, whether it's the agar or the broth, um, it's the same thing, plus minus gelling agent, is extremely salt. Not all organisms tolerate high salt content very well. So LB is great for intestinal bacteria in general. Um, so LB is one that has been specifically developed for growing E. coli because E. coli is such a powerhouse of model organisms in the lab. And E. coli is an intestinal bacteria. So it lies, likes living inside of our body, and inside of our body is quite salty. That's why there's so much salt in there. It's salty and it's warm. Um, the other, one of the others we're trying today is uh, this tomato juice pie veg, which is vegetone agar. Um, Poured some plates of yesterday. Yeah, this one might be a little bit harder to find. That's fairly specialized. This is somewhat specialized, but um, this, this is a a vegan growth medium that we bought to grow some of our cheese ripening cultures for the vegan cheese project. So, so. this is, it is as Patrick says. This is basically the vegetable based variety. Um, uh, a basic peptone agar, which is also useful for growing a bunch of different things. This says, use. This medium is prepared by completely replacing animal-based peptones with vegetable peptones for cultivation and enumeration of lactobacilli from saliva and other acidophilic bacteria. I figured kombucha tends to get pretty acidic, this might be useful for that, so we're going to give that a try. I have no idea whether it's going to work, by the way. I uh, just want to give you a heads up that all of the plating we're going to be doing later, apart from the E. coli colony picking, I don't know whether it's going to work. All right, and also interrupt with questions whenever, because I, I know I, I talk constantly other slides. So you feel like you get your money's worth or something? So the improvised way votes. Yeah, I don't know if there are any GMO teas. I don't think there are any developed yet. Uh, GMO is sugar. It's just sugar. It's the same chemical. I would so. suspect that this is superstition based on the assumption that those uh, that whatever pesticides were used in the cultivation of the sugar cane or the tea somehow makes its way into that final product, mm -hmm. which admittedly is possible, but until somebody actually demonstrates it, we 
research, I'm going to call it superstition. Yeah. I would be much more concerned about using uh, distilled or bottled water rather than tap water, because the tap water does have chlorine compounds in it that might inhibit fermentation. Water, it would the filtering, the, the filtering isn't going to remove the, the chlorine, right? It doesn't, um, in, in general, like a standard water filter doesn't really do mm -hmm. all that much. Not even remove, water it removes growth. That's a different right. matter. That is not your standard water filter. That is a reverse osmosis yeah. system. So yeah, if you have something like a milliQ system and can can prepare milliQ water, then that's a totally different. Mm -hmm. And and I hear just pouring out water uh, like the day before, just tap water and just let it sit for a day. Uh, a lot of the chlorine will have will have disappeared already as well. I don't know if that's true. I haven't measured it, but if you don't have access to filter to uh, distilled water, that's an option. Uh, sunlight exposure is pretty effective, actually. Uh, the hypochlorite is A, it's pretty volatile to begin with, which is why you can smell it at all. But also, it's uh, highly UV labile. So the breakdown very rapidly under UV light. So if, if you really can't, if you can't get clean water otherwise, Take your tap water, set it in like bright sun for half a day or a day, boil it, boil the hell out of it, and then filter it. Um, uh, label all the things. I'm not dating and naming these because we're going to use it all up today, so I don't need to. But I do need to be able to tell the difference between these three bottles when we go to pour them. So I'm labeling each one with what I'm putting in here. So, so if you don't have access to all this lab gear, uh, you can totally autoclave things in a pressure cooker. You don't need a fancy lab autoclave. A pressure cooker does the exact same thing. Uh, you can make things in jars instead of fancy yeah. Erlenmeyer flasks. Totally. Uh, just make sure everything is, is as clean as you can humanly make it. Um, I, I think some of the brewing sanitizers are optimized to kill bacteria, but not yeast. Um, uh, so in that case, that might not be as good so for what we're doing here. Dry down. They're not necessarily. So like I said, it really depends on what you're doing. But Patrick's not wrong. Like, just pressure cook everything. If you have a standard pressure cooker, pressure cook your glass for your utensils. Plus your Tupperware might not spot. Um, so that might not be a great idea. But, you know, Plasticware is typically not a good idea to use for any brewing anyway because the scratches in the plastic can hold on to a lot of bacteria. So it's really hard to get plastic perfectly clean. So the agar and the xanthan gum that we're using, in general, they're called hydrogels. Uh, hydrogel you're probably familiar with is jello. And when you're making jello, you notice it's mostly water, right? You compare to the, the, the weight of the water, the amount of gelatin you're actually adding is tiny. It's the same thing with these. Uh, whatever gel you have in your plate is going to be mostly water. Agar is just another gelling material that's been extracted from uh, uh, from algae. Yeah. Also, some of these tend to clump more than others. She's using a food brand. There may be like an anti-clumping agent in there. So yeah. Plate in here. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is a class. You're watching me make tea. <laughs> yeah. Be careful if you're doing this at home if you don't have a tempered glass container. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't pour water yes, into yes. water into stuff you don't know and stuff. Uh, all the lab glassware is Pyrex, is borosilicate glass, essentially, yeah. that can handle big temperature changes. Which I suck at, by the way. One thing I'd like to get better at be like, okay, I'm going to take a break to go do this other thing, such as, you know, eat food, or improve my work conditions. It's not very difficult. All right, okay, that's interesting. Send it back to Agar, went straight into solution. But the same thing goes, um, oh, wow. oh wow, that's setting already, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know. I don't know. I, we 
I think we're going to autoclave it and yeah. hope that autoclaving will resolubilize it, and then we may need to pour it while it's much hotter. Yeah. We'll see. Well, a, a lot of these. There's also a lot of gelling agent in this mixed one because yeah. I think I uh, exaggerated a little bit. This one looks like it's behaving a bit better, but it might be worth reading the instructions <laughs> on the xanthan gum. <laughs> I think xanthan is one of those things that uh, you can add even to cold liquids and it'll gel. Does that say anything about mm -hmm. how to handle it? But yeah, I'm wondering whether it's like corn, kind of like cornstarch where maybe you should uh, like whip it up. And yeah, and yeah. The question is, should we make more of the stuff with the bag so people can pour mm -hmm. more than one What's plate? the third one there? Oh, that's also xanthan? or? So all these hydrogels have different temperatures at which you're supposed to hydrate them, which is when you're mixing them with water. Uh, then you typically have to heat them up to a certain temperature where they, where the sort of the gelling reaction starts happening, and then you cool them down for the gel to set. And all these hydrogels will have different temperatures at which they do that. I think xanthan is actually one of those where it actually starts gelling at room temperature. So that might be the problem here. Uh, another common gel that's used uh, in a lab, especially for uh, working with, with plants, is uh, gel and gum. Uh, it's another, another gel material. I think that one also might be from seaweed. I don't remember for sure. So we actually have Laura from Argentina joining us on, over the Zoom. So wave to Laura. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? All right, so um, with this crazy mess in hand, I have no idea how this is going to work. Yeah, let's, so let's see what happens. Say, you know what I forgot, Patrick? What? I don't know, Lisa, but... The sugar. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Are you just going to start over? <laughs> <laughs> you could measure out some sugar and add it to each flatter. By the way, if you're doing real lab work as opposed to teaching a class, don't talk and work at the same time <laughs> because you're just spitting a whole bunch of bacteria in your work as well. I'm going to put the All right. And it, <laughs> good job for remembering. Setting a bad example is as like, valuable as setting a good one. <laughs> it's like, hey, nothing grows on these plates. Yeah. The weirdest, clumpiest, lumpiest stuff. Okay, okay. Put it on the magnetic. We have other lactobacillus media as well. <laughs> um, of the little ones we use, you should be able to pour about 10 each out of a 100 ml flask. That, and you're being pretty generous with your pour. Um, so, so these are not standard size plates, they're, they're smaller ones? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Specialist assigned to, to getting our Hamilton's daughter. And he and I have been hanging out in the the past four months trying to bring that instrument up and, and he is uh he has a background in the everybody come into the lab and we'll show you how the autoclave works come meet come meet one of the most useful tools in the lab the autoclave between the autoclave and the biosafety cabinet you go always 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 use a drip tray look at me i made a mess yesterday <laughs> and here are the remnants <laughs> of the mess i made yesterday uh, this one we may actually have paid like four hundred dollars for, which is like dirt cheap for an autoclave, but it's still fairly expensive for us. Uh, don't use this piece of equipment without being trained on it. So pay attention. Uh, if you become a member or you're one of our projects, you can 
after this class, you'll be trained on how to use it. Right. Um, so it's essentially, it's a horizontal pressure cooker. Yeah. Um, first thing to do is check what the water level is and they're all somewhat different. In this case, there's actually a little plastic tube right here. See, and the water level is right there. I'm just pulling it out to make it a little bit more visible. Uh, there is a, a, fill, a refill line and a max line and it's just about at the refill line right now so we can add a little bit more water. Always add distilled water. Uh, you add water over here. Um, if you don't use distilled water, this thing is going to heat up and any salts in the water are going to collect inside of the heating coils and start blocking everything. Um, basically destroy the that's, that's the same reason why you're using a tray underneath your, oops, your liquids. Uh, because if that boils over, it winds up in the, in the inside of the compartment and it essentially gets sucked back into the water reservoir. So if you have like gel that winds up in the water reservoir that goes through all the tubing, it'll start setting in the tubing, it blocks everything and can completely destroy the, the autoclave. So when you've prepared everything you want to autoclave, this you can also, you know, if you want to autoclave labware and tools, um, what you'll often do, for instance, if you wanted to make uh, glycerol stock culture for your freezer, is you'll autoclave your little cryo vials before you prep those. You just take a regular beaker, pour your Eppendorf tubes, your cryo vials or whatever in there, cover it with foil, and then you can autoclave this. You can use it for like solid objects as well. You can use it for your metal tools. Um, and notice okay, you, that you put that uh, yeah. aluminum foil cap on each of the flasks. Yeah. That helps a little bit with overboiling, not much, yeah. but mainly after you've, you've taken the flask back out again, it prevents them from being reinfected. No. For agar, it typically doesn't matter too much if you've gotten all the clumps out because the autoclaving will dissolve it all. This autoclave is actually really, really simple. Um, we used to have a manual. It just has too many buttons at all. But so notice it's it's not on right now, right? It's not currently on. Uh, there's click, two buttons on the back. You click the reset button on the back, either resets it or turns it on, mm -hmm. depending on what you're trying to do. Then on the front, there's an on standby button. If you wanted to check what the settings was for a given program, in this case, we're doing liquids, so we're going to press the liquid buttons once. It's got 15 minutes at 255, which is basically perfect for media. But if you wanted to change that. Uh, it's 255 Fahrenheit. Yeah, that's course. 255 Fahrenheit. Which is because we are a silly country that has not yet adopted scientific measurements. <laughs> 121 degrees Celsius, which is optimal for uh, sterilizing liquid media. So, but if you wanted to change that, say, do this, Hold on. So, uh, <laughs> let's see, what are you trying to change? The time? So, yeah, you click sterilize time set first, then liquids. To change those settings, check, push the button for whatever setting you want to change first, and then the button for the program you want to run, so. A couple of features. Notice there's a latch here to actually close the door. Make sure that's set to the green. There is a pressure gauge right there, which right now reads zero. Uh, do not ever try to open the autoclave while it's under pressure. So it will go through these stages here. Right now it says condition. It's filling. Uh, it's essentially it's putting a little bit of water in the, uh, the compartment and it's going to heat that up. Uh, in a moment, it'll start showing what the current temperature is. And then once it's get to, to the, the correct temperature, it'll switch to sterilize. And that's when that 15 minutes starts counting, essentially. So you'll see it counting down at that point. Once it's done its 15 minutes, it switches to exhaust. At that point, there's lots of pressurized steam in there, and it gradually releases that pressure. And that's where you might get overboiling, potentially. Um, and then once it's done doing that, the, it'll switch to complete. And if you check the, 
the pressure gauge, the pressure should be down to zero at that point. Uh, when you open the door at that point, you're still going to get a cloud of steam coming out. So don't like hover over it. But it's like opening a, a pot that's cooking, essentially. Don't like put your face. Actually, this one does not have an outflow of air. So this one is the kind that protects you from what you're working on and protects what you're working on from you. That's about safety cabinet. Yeah, yes, but you, you don't actually have any air coming does. out. It has, it has a laminar flow across the bottom that nope. comes down and out this way. Not this one. I lift Not this up one. the model, Patrick. Are you <laughs> kidding me? Yeah, it does. No, no. This one also sucks in air from here into yeah. the grating. And yes, it, so it has a vertical mm -hmm. curtain of air and it has laminar flow across the table. Across the table, yes. Yeah, that's right. But I'm any of the air in the table does not come out. No, no, that, yes. I know, I know. But yeah. it's still positive pressure in the sense that there is a constant outflow of air from the back to the front. Yes. So, so there's, but not, so there's, from, not from the hood to the environment, no, not to you. Because yes. That's why it's about a safety cabinet instead of a flow hood. That's the fundamental difference. A flow hood is just under pressure, it just pushes air out so a particular from the atmosphere can't fall in, can't, can't get in. This one, as Patrick says, does both. It does it does a laminar flow of air across the across the work surface, so from the back outwards, that gets sucked in in that grate in front that pulls down. There is also a flow of air from up in here, just basically vertical coming down this way. That means that whatever is inside the hood can't get out. And you'll see if you look down, the, the ceiling is full of holes so there's a big grating there that the air gets pushed through so that the entire top of the machine is one big filter. The bias safety cabinet is the cleanest area we have in the entire building and we need to keep it that way. So, mm -hmm. so generally speaking always wipe the hood clean before you start working in here and after you are done working in here. If you have any stainless steel, never clean it with bleach. Yeah. Bleach will actually corrode stainless steel. 70% so alcohol, whether ethanol or isopropanol, is your friend because it is non-toxic. Yeah, don't drink it, it's denatured. Um, but it's non-toxic <laughs> and it won't corrode your surfaces unless you're using it on acrylic, in which case isopropanol will actually dissolve acrylic pretty rapidly. Um, so the rule for the biosafety cabinet, just like any other surfaces here in the lab, you clean it before and after you use it. Yeah. Don't assume that the previous person has left it clean for you. And please clean after you're done and leave it clean for the next one. Then this switch over here switches back and forth between the fluorescent light off and a UV light, which isn't faring so well, and that you generally yeah, don't want to I look guess. straight at, and that you definitely don't want to stick your hands in under because this is low range UVC light. It will give you skin cancer. I am not joking. It will give you skin cancer. It will damage your retinas. Uh, there's a reason why we use it to sterilize shit because it's not good for living things for you. Yeah. After the autoclave, that UV light is probably the, the second most dangerous thing in the lab here. Yeah. So never work in the biosafety cabinet with a UV light on. Just a reflection of the, the stainless steel in your eyes will probably burn out your retinas. So don't do that. Yes. So, so notice there's uh, errors on here. Uh, this thing is designed to have the sash at a specific level, and that's where the, the airflow is doing the right thing. Since we are sort of community lab, this is not in constant use either. Um, so we're probably okay. There's actually a pressure gauge on the side that's worth keeping an eye on. If it gets to 1.5, that's, that's... What the hell kind of pressure measurements is yeah, that? Yeah, I know, they all do that. What the, is this? <laughs> Can we get it in like in bar or in atmospheres or in pest <laughs> or in... So that gives you an idea of the pressure uh, that's required to force the air through the filter. So as the filter accumulates more dust, it's going to get filled up and you, the pressure is going to increase. Yeah. 70% is optimal. Yeah. 
apparently you need a little bit of water for the, uh, the alcohol to do its job killing bacteria. Uh, so most of the lab materials that we have here are shared. Uh, you can definitely buy your own reagents and put your name on it, and then those are for you. Most people, when they need to reorder agar or whatever, they just order a jar and put it in the cabinet, and it's free for use by anybody. Uh, people tend to be pretty good about sharing reagents. Uh, the flip side on that is that you you don't have completely control over if anybody contaminated the reagents or whatever. So if you're paranoid, if you're working on an experiment that, that you've been working for years and you spend a lot of money on, you may want to buy your own reagents and put it in a locker and only use those. Uh, it's just like some people have their own pipetters because they prefer not to have to worry about who used them last. Uh, insulin is a small protein. Uh, it was the very first genetically engineered drug on the market, but that was almost 30 years ago. And there are still no generic forms of insulin available right now. And meanwhile, the price of insulin is just keep going up exponentially. Like every six months or so, they just increase it by a few percent. It's like small enough that nobody notices, but it's like, uh, and all that price increase is entirely unjustified because all the research on insulin was done in the 70s and 80s. So we're trying to develop a novel method for producing insulin. It's going to be the same insulin, just a different procedure for making it. And we're trying to make completely open science, unpatented, so anybody can use it. Essentially, we need to be able to get more generics companies to start entering the market and start producing cheap insulin. Uh, even here in the US, it's gotten to the point that uh, some people cannot afford their life-saving medication. There, there is a black market for insulin in the US. We've seen people sell uh, leftover insulin for deceased relatives on Craigslist. <laughs> yep. Uh, and developing countries, there's entire countries that run out of insulin for months at a time. A synthetic biology uh, protein expression project, essentially protein expression and purification. So we insert the gene for making pro-insulin uh, in uh, a yeast. Right now we're working in uh, Picchia pastoris, which is a type of yeast that's often used for industrial production of, of proteins. Uh, and then essentially you turn that yeast into a little protein factory and you crank out a whole bunch of it and then you purify it out of that yeast and that's your, your insulin. Uh, so I mentioned it's a small molecule, it's a small, sorry, small protein. Uh, it's actually two peptides that are sort of bound together and, but it initially in the body, it initially gets expressed as a single protein that then gets processed, it gets cleaved into three chunks and one of those disappears and the other two bind each other. Uh, so it's a little bit complicated, not as simple as just making a protein and then you can use it. Um, so How are you testing that it's actually functional? Right, so that's something we've been scratching our head over. Uh, there are several antibodies available for mature insulin and we're hoping to be able to find something that binds uh, the mature intact insulin, but not pro-insulin, for example. Uh, so that would be one easy way of doing it. Um, yeah, it's something we haven't fully researched. What are the requirements for being able to tell that you have uh, uh, correctly folded mature insulin? Uh, we can separate out some of the different folding forms. Uh, we have an HPLC that we're getting up and running. Uh, so, and, but exactly how can you tell uh, the correctly folded mature insulin from slightly misfolded mature insulin? That is a, sort of a, a detail that I'm not entirely certain about yet right now, but it's, I'm sure that it's in some of the the papers from the 70s and 80s. So it's just a matter of doing some more literature from that. Uh, and if it's if it's not in the public literature, it will be in the patent applications from the 70s and 80s, which have expired by now. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have them? Yeah, yeah. Patents are, are open to anybody. Right, uh, yeah, that, that is the grand bargain behind patents, uh, which is that you actually do have to publish what you're doing uh, and there's a public, public patent application that tells the entire world how you're doing it, but then you have a monopoly over using it for 20 years.
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, sitting in the hood, ready to work. Here's the hood. So again, she she like really cleaned the hood. Now we need to bring something very dirty in there, which is the kombucha. So. <laughs> So she's using a device called a serological pipette. It's known as the pipette. I think those might be the, the squeezy bulbs, aren't they? Yeah, well, this is actually a squeezy bulb. Yeah. I'm just going to do 25 millimeters of these. Get more of that is way more. So, so the in, in terms of biochemistry, uh, the sugar gets converted first into alcohol and then into acetic acid. Yeah. Right. So it's just like when you're brewing beer. Uh, everybody cautions it to keep like it nice and closed and put in a water lock on it and everything. And that's to avoid getting acetic acid bacteria in your beer because they would be converting the alcohol to acetic acid otherwise, and then you get vinegar instead of beer. Uh, in this case, in kombucha, we actually want to have those acetic acid bacteria there, and we want to provide lots of oxygen to the culture, which is why you don't close off the top when you're brewing kombucha. You put a towel over it or some other cloth, and you tighten it with rubber bands, so there's lots of oxygen available for the bacteria to do their job. Um, so the sugar is going to get eventually turned into acetic acid and some lactic acid and a whole bunch of other compounds that sort of give the, the, the flavors to the kombucha. So, but yeah, if, if you let it go for too long, uh, kombucha typically gets brewed for one or two weeks or so. One week is probably good for most people. Uh, if you let it go longer than that, it does turn into something very vinegary, not terribly drinkable. Uh, but the more acidic it becomes, the less it's prone to contamination. Uh, so when you first start your kombucha culture with a very sweet tea, pretty much anything can grow on that. As it gets more acidic, uh, it starts excluding molds and things like that that can't live at those pHs. So that's uh, why I brought a very mature uh, and a very sour slug in mm -hmm. today is because I know that the chances of fungal contamination in here is really low and also that the acidity here in itself is going to make it easier for me to keep stuff clean. This is for those. And notice everything that goes into the biosafety cabinet gets sprayed with alcohol and cleaned off. Everything gets cleaned down. That includes your hands and your forearm. Yesterday, we're going to try spreading some kombucha on those. Um, I also have some plates that I streak a little bit of Yan C. coli glycerol stock to, so we can try the colony picking. Um, so, again, uh, wipe alcohol over your forearms up to the elbows because yeah. you're going to be sticking your arms inside the biosafety cabinet. Indeed. You don't want to introduce bacteria in there. <laughs> Latex gloves get sticky after a while mm. from the IPA. Yeah. Like they're coated with something. Well, they're normally coated with powder, and you're probably wiping off some of the powder. So yeah, I poured all of these plates in here yesterday after having cleaned the hood out thoroughly. So these should be in five. Well, there are actually six different kinds of plates in here. Um, I mean, we still have the autoclave that's running with uh, the auger that we made oh so this is the this is actually the one of the media um mm -hmm. i'm looking forward to testing that is I that think the mrs this is the mrs yeah cheryl was having a hard time getting the the gel to set on that one but oh. you seem to be okay i yeah it was uh it looked like it wasn't gonna set properly but then i spilled a couple of drops and they hardened immediately and uh, yeah, I had no problems. Yeah, it looks at all. fine. I had no problems at all. 
I don't know how much agar she added, like that's a broth. And I admit, I stole some of Eric, Eric with his mm -hmm. uh, advanced agar instead of uh, taking yeah. the chance with the back to agar. I did find uh, some of the old back to agar that Alan has labeled that says is good, uh, but use double for good going. So maybe she just didn't use enough because it's kind of old. Yeah, it's also quite acidic. And we we're wondering if, if that might be interfering with the agar. I mean, like I said, this is the advanced agar, and looks perfectly good to me. We'll see yeah. how hard it is when we go to spread on it, but uh, so far I'm encouraged. So, all right. So some of these are for kombucha. Most of these are for the kombucha, but some of them are not. So these LB plates that I'm setting over in here. They're just for the E. coli, so they're just for the colony picking. Um, and notice that uh, everything Ricky is pulled labeled. out some tools there as well. On I the put side. tools in. I labeled everything. I labeled. This was by far the most annoying part of what I had to do yesterday was label 30 plates with what's <laughs> on them. But label everything. So all of these contain what's on there, who made it, and when it was made. That is the bare minimum of information you want to include with something like this. If you're going to prepare a whole sleeve, it's it's acceptable to put the labeling on the sleeve, it but then is. once you actually put something on the plates, like you the streaking of bacteria, anyway. label the individual plates. Okay, so the process here, we don't actually have to make all of these plates, but I would like to make a sizable portion of them. I was initially thinking that we would try to plate some of the mother as well and take little pieces of the scoby and try laying on the plate, but I haven't really found a good way of handling it with the hood and cutting it yeah. up and all of that. So we, we, we should get some uh, cellulase enzymes so we can actually degrade the mother that's and get the bacteria idea. out of it. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. This is a micro pipette. It is your friend. It is the single most used and useful tool in the lab. Uh, not instrument, mind you, but tool. So this is a high precision measuring device, at least if it is properly calibrated, which this one approximately is. Um, it has a little dial on top that you screw on to set the volume. Since this is a thousand microliter pipette, which you can read on top, in that it is able to pipette anywhere between a hundred microliters and a thousand microliters, which is one milliliter. It only has three numbers on the dial, which means that you have to imagine that the last digit is included on the dial itself. You'll so, often see black and red numbers on there. The color changes at the 1000s. Yep. So we are going to set this to 200 microliters. We're going to set this to 100 microliters because there is plenty of growth in here. Um, I haven't actually done an OD reading on this, which I probably should have right. before we started. But given how unclear this is, like you notice the T is glass clear when we start. And the T here was also glass clear when we started. So I can assure you that everything that makes this not glass clear is alive. Bacteria, probably predominantly yeast, because Dan likes really yeasty stuff for some reason. And also I had a whole bunch of dead yeast on the bottom that I kicked up during transport. So that's what's in here. This one says L10, so the maximum volume is 10 microliter. So 10 on this dial is a hundred because we're trying to represent four numbers with only three. And it has a lock and an unlock. Right now it's unlocked so you can freely turn it. You press that this way and it is now fixed on that volume and shouldn't change. So a pipette has, I mean actually, you know what, I'm going to dial this back up because it's easier for demonstration. Going to dial this back up now, set to 700. Pipette has three positions it has the plunger relaxed, plunger partly depressed, 
plunger all the way to press. So you see there, there are three. One, two, three positions. So this entire thing is an air displacement mechanism. There's a plunger inside that displaces a fixed volume of air based on your settings. And when you release that plunger, allows that same volume of air to be sucked back up. Or if your pipette with a tip on it, mind you, is immersed in a liquid, will suck that same volume of liquid up into the tip. I'm just gonna do a quick demonstration here. There are many finesses to good pipetting technique. I'm not going to teach all of them today, but some. Generally speaking, hold your pipette vertically. If you are pipetting large volumes, you can immerse it like five to six millimeters below the surface. Try to track down as you go. When you are dispensing, at a slight angle, if you need to dispense along the side of the container or dispense actually in the liquid and pull out without releasing the plunger that is or if you're really trying to be accurate the trick is to disperse right at the surface that is by far the most accurate but it is also the most troublesome so generally i like to do against the side of the container because the wicking effect of the container itself will pull the liquid out of your pipette tip you're often going to have a tiny little bit of volume left in there. If you need to be more accurate than that, you can calibrate your way out of things like that. But the way this works is you start relaxed, you push it down to the first stop, then you immerse in the liquid and relax. You pull it out of the liquid, transfer it to whatever container you're going on to, side or whatever, push down to the first stop, and then all the way down to eject the last space of air and remove all of the liquid. So first stop, second stop, and done. And then you eject your pipette tip. If you have one of these fancy ass pipettes with an auto ejector, by pushing this white button over here, that kicks the tip off. Um, the other thing, the other tool we're gonna work with right here are these. We don't have enough spreaders, I think, to do all of these plates. Um, I don't mind recycling the same one because it's the same culture on the same media type. So we can probably just do one per, per yeah. Let's just do one per stack or one per stack of five. I've been told that we have a lot of them at work and I can have some if I want some. But we actually we have, have some here. Plate. Oh, yeah, we just need to do some of those actually. Yeah. Anyways, so, so notice all these spreaders are in closed packages. They come sterile. That's yeah. very important. It is really Same important. Same thing is true with the inoculation loops. Do you want to show the inoculation loop? Uh, yeah. So these little things over in here are inoculation loops. They're basically a very long plastic handle with a tiny little loop or a little circle on the end. They are very good for picking colonies and streaking colonies onto plates or streaking on plates, whether from colonies or from liquid culture or otherwise. You know, does they come in a plastic baggie that is sealed to begin with? This one has only ever been opened in the hood, so I trust it to be clean. Whether that's sensible of me or not if, is open for If you don't use them all up, uh, close them up nice and tightly again, right on the package. It was opened on this date in the biosafety cabinet by this person and put them back. Yep. If it has that on there, I don't mind reusing them. If I find an anomalous baggie that has been opened, I'm never going to use those. So another thing regarding the use of hoods is generally um try to set things up in such a way that that you have your workflow planned out that you know where you're going to reach for what how you're going to move around um and if you can set it up in such a way not everything is equally clean 
basically. Um, so generally, if you can set up a workflow that goes from clean to less clean, that's a really good idea. That's not always possible, but um, yeah, best, best attempts made. So generally when we incubate and store plates, we store them upside down so that any condensation on the inside does not fall down onto the agar surface. When we need to spread liquid samples the way we're going to now, we have to turn them around to spread on them and we have to leave them open for a little while while they dry. Okay, so I will now proceed to show you how to spread. So I'll do a couple of these real quick and just show you. Um, I'm going to use this to put my spreader in so I can reuse it between goes and I'm just going to do two plates here. Oh, I might not even need to if I do it right. Be smart about it. So pipette, 100 microliters of liquid, dump it on the middle of the agar without poking the pipette tip into the agar. Let's say that again. Do not poke your pipette tip into the agar. So just drop the liquid on there, replace the lid. Do not lift the lid up and do this. Lift, lift the lid off and do this. Keep it facing the right way up, keep it at an angle. So again, you can open lids with your palm and have your free, your fingers free to do work, which is incredibly helpful. Spreader basically just allows you to spread the liquid evenly across the surface of the plate. There is a lot of freaking liquid on there. Yeah, 100 microliters is a bit much for these yeah. models. Yes, I'm used to working on larger plates. You can switch to 50 microliter. Yeah, I'm just going to find a smaller pipette. Just for reference, so, a standard droplet of water is 50 microliter. So, so she's using two droplets essentially. Yeah, it's not we're, large. We're often working in the lab with volumes like two microliters or a fraction of a microliter occasionally. So I just push all of those over to the side. And so you'll notice I'm leaving these sitting to the back here with the lid kipped a little bit. And that's so the laminar airflow can pull the moisture off the surface as it flows um, because they'll dry a lot faster that way. So kip the lid, take the lid Generally do not leave the lid off your pipette tip unless you want very unhappy lab mates. Put on the middle of the plate. 